Today, I am super excited to introduce you all to one of our global pervasive computational epidemiology students. And I am not going to offend all his ancestors by trying to pronounce his last name, but Luca is one of my favorite all-time undergrads at UVA. I have had the immense pleasure of working with him for the past couple of years on our special sprint team, which I know he will tell you all about. So Luca, we'll start with you telling me your last name. Sounds good, Erin. Thank you for that <laughs> amazing introduction. Hi, everyone. My name is Luca Gabitsinashvili. Um, I am an undergraduate student at the University of Virginia. I am double majoring in environmental sciences and economics and minoring in data analytics. And as Erin mentioned, I am on the sprint team doing computational epidemiology at Biocomplexity Institute. Okay, so you, so you listed three different areas yes. that you're interested in. <laughs> okay. Tell me how those things converge and tell me what you have found most interesting or not or surprising about that convergence of those areas. Yes. Yeah, so I did list three things. I had a very broad range of interests coming into UVA okay. uh, and I kind of solidified into those three areas because I am really passionate about sustainability. And I oh. think combining my like environmental sciences education with economics education and with a little bit of data analytics in there, I'm able to call that sustainability. <laughs> yes, for sure. So have you found any overlap at all in your classes that you're taking? I have not. The okay. overlap that I can kind of describe is the topic overlap. So for example, in environmental sciences, we learn about just general environmental processes. So that includes hydrology, geology, ecology, atmosphere and weather, with a little bit of climate equity and environmental justice. Yes. And in economics, we learn about the general economic theory, which is microeconomics, macroeconomics. But I was able to take a lot of electives that focus on the environment. So for example, environmental economics, sustainability economics. And there, there is a little bit of overlap because sure. there's that, like environmental factor in it, but it's still yeah. very economics oriented of resource allocation when it comes to like in a general economy and like sustainable business practices. But they're still very different because environmental sciences is very science oriented. Really, it's like research projects and just very like nitty gritty science of like how earth works and economics is about just resources, but in like a man-made business environment and economy. Right. When you were talking about the environmental stuff, there was definitely a lot of ology yes. <laughs> at the end of your topics, lots of ologies. And it also seems not that the two groups are opposed, but mm -hmm. economics makes me think let's make a lot of money. And environmental makes me think, let's save our planet. So I think it's fabulous that, that you have been able to take your interest in both of those things mm -hmm. to merge them because that's the way forward. Mm -hmm. That really is the way forward. We've got to bring those two sides together. If we're going to save this planet that we have broken. Yes, I definitely relate to what you said about the environmental science department being all about saving the environment and the economics being like, let's use all the resources because that's exactly what I noticed in class. Because oh. in my economics classes, it's all about theoretical calculations of how we can best utilize resources and do it as fast as possible, but also like conserve it for future generations. But there is that emphasis of using what we have on earth right. and consuming it. And not really think about the consequences of that when it comes to climate change, for example. And so our like, non-winter winter <laughs> that we've had. And yes. the fact that California is like an island right now with all the water that they've had unusually. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we know that these are your interests, right? This environment and the economy and analyzing the data comes out of both of those sides. 
But how did you even imagine that that these were things that you could study? Or did you just keep finding yourself drawn to these sorts of things? I kept finding myself drawn to the two different sectors because, I don't know, since childhood, I was passionate about the environment, going outdoors, conserving nature, because where I grew up, that wasn't the case. Environment was not, environmental conservation and protection was not something that was even considered in day-to-day life because there was no waste management, no recycling, Oh, um, a lot of underground water usage that's very unsustainable. Um, So eventually as I grew up, I I realized that these are things that we can address and that should be addressed, but in many communities and other countries, it's not being addressed. So that's something that I really wanted to study because it's really fascinating how our world works because everything's interconnected. And if you like introduce unbalance into one cycle, then it affects all the other cycles. So I just wanted to really learn about that. Okay. And that is such a perfect segue to the pandemic. Yes. (laughs) Right? Because there was definitely something out of balance Mm -hmm. somewhere. And because we're all interconnected, this really tough little virus was able to just jump all over the globe. And that's where the sprint team comes in, right? So tell me about the sprint team. Yes. So we came up with the name Sprint. It stands for Student Pandemic Researchers Dash Interventions. There's a group of us, which are undergraduate student researchers. And what we do is we collect data on pandemic intervention on a county level, specifically non-pharmaceutical intervention. So for example, when did the county government institute mask mandates, stay-at-home orders, Uh, When did they close down public schools? When were businesses, non-essential businesses asked to shut down? So we collect all of that data through various sources, a lot of internet resources, some emailing county officials, a lot of social media from those county governments. And then we compile that into a database. Why? Great question. Because if you're doing something, what is the significance of the work? We, we're doing it because having that data available for public use will be beneficial as other scientists and non-scientific communities can use that to better guide their decision making to eventually prepare the world in a better fashion for a future global health crisis. And that information is going away. I know you, you all, the entire team is starting to really have a hard time Mm -hmm. finding those dates because the websites, the counties are are like, we don't need to have this COVID website up anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So in our team, we, during validation process of our data, we call that as decayed data because we want to go, if we found a link that provided a beneficial information, sometimes when we click on, when we click on that link, it's just not available anymore. So yes, as you mentioned, some counties are taking down their information, which is concerning because then we're unable to collect it. And I know a lot of researchers that we work with on this project are very excited with this, to be able to use this data, because what they can imagine is, you know, you talked about government officials being able to use this to help in their decisions. Mm -hmm. What we think can happen is we can look at a time series of of how the virus progressed and lay your data mm-hmm. that the sprint team has collected on top of that and see if we can tell did that make a difference you yeah. know that we close stuff that we open stuff have you uh, i know you just had a you all just had a paper published yes we have <laughs> very exciting tell me about that yeah so recently our paper got published in nature scientific data Some of our undergraduates and also the PhD candidates worked on compiling that information into a solid paper format, which is very exciting because when we all got the notification that it was published, everyone was just ecstatic. So that's a great step forward to sharing our findings with the world. And that is a big deal. Nature scientific communication is a really awesome place to have your work published as an undergrad. Yeah, (laughs) 
there are graduate students who would love to get into one of the nature journals. So Mm -hmm. very exciting, very exciting for the whole team. I know. And you're going to present this research in Richmond. Yes, we were accepted to go to the CCI symposium in Richmond in a couple of weeks, both to present the data using poster presentation format and also present the paper to, I think, more advanced scientific community that are there to ask a lot of difficult and smart questions. (laughs) Right. And it's going to be okay if you're like, I do not know the answer (laughs) to what you are saying, but I will look it up. It's always the safe answer, right? Or I'll get back to you. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. So this work in particular, if you, do you have nieces or nephews or little cousins? Yeah. Okay. And they say, Luca, what are you doing? So imagine if you're one of your third grader (laughs) age-ish folks ask, what do you do at school? They're like, I... I'm doing multiplication. Two times four is eight. What do you do? How would you describe that? That's a great question and like a very fun question because sometimes I have to describe the work that we do to myself in that fashion because when things get complex, (laughs) I need to like dumb it down a little bit. Yes. Especially I remember like first few weeks of me joining the team, it was rough because it was just a lot of information and just a lot of like high level the way it was communicated, it was very high level. So I had to like kind of take a step back and really consume the information that was thrown at me. But if I were to describe what our team does to a third grader, I would say, (laughs) hi, third grader. (laughs) As you probably remember, there was a period of time where we all had to stay home. We were not allowed to leave. And then we all had to wear masks in public places and schools. And this was all because of coronavirus that caused COVID-19 pandemic. I would say our team researches the situation. What we do is we collect the start and end dates of different temporary regulations that local governments put in place to protect the people from this virus. And these regulations include the time periods where we all had to wear masks, do remote learning from home, stay at home and not leave after curfew, not be able to visit some of our non-essential favorite businesses in town and many other things that we couldn't do. What we do is we collect data on that. We look at when we couldn't start doing it and then when we could continue doing it. And then the reason we do this is because we want to make sure that we are better prepared for a future pandemic or a global health crisis. Yes. Safe. We want to be safe for sure. All right. So you've had this unusual experience of collecting this data set and actually being the one who has to search for the data, find the data, make sure the data is accurate and consistent, which is very tedious, I know. And then in your classes, you've had the experience of analyzing that data for assignments, not that data, but analyzing data Mm -hmm. for assignments. And you are studying economics and you're studying environmental things. So all of these experiences that you've had in your young two decades of life on this planet, what do you think ultimately is the job that that you're going to be, that's going to be the job that you retire from or the career okay. field. That's like, yeah. I did it. I got my, this is, this is it. This is the job mm-hmm. that I've wanted. Mm-hmm. What do you think it is? That's a tough question. Cause there's just so many options in the world that you can do. And we don't um, know all the jobs. Like yeah. we don't even know all the jobs that exist. So yeah. many jobs. Yeah. yeah. But what do you think? I'm pretty sure, as you noticed, computational epidemiology is very different from what I study in school. Mm -hmm. Um, But one overlap that there is that I believe in is that with a pandemic or a global health crisis, that can be motivated by the environment and the way environment works. Because overpopulation, as we are exponentially growing, eventually in natural ecosystems with like just animals and birds, we notice that populations collapse 
because there's just so many of them. So that's how I was able to join the team when it comes to epidemiology. But when it comes to my ultimate dream job, I think I have to kind of go back to my roots of just passion for sustainability and environmental sciences. So I would say I'm just going to make up a position title here. My ultimate dream job would be to be a corporate sustainability specialist at an organization and helping them reach their climate targets, account greenhouse gas emissions, and report ESG reporting. Yeah. Oh, I love that so much. Yeah. Very really different awesome. from what I do right now. <laughs> it is very different. But I would also say that a commonality in all of that is your love of social justice issues. Yes. Because the pandemic definitely uncovered so many inequities. Mm -hmm. You talked about having to do remote learning. How many people live in places that don't have good Wi-Fi? Yes. How many kids don't have parents at home because they were working because they're working in the service industry and those folks had to go to work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Speaking about that, I remember right now, as we are collecting more data on our team, I noticed that some counties that I'm collecting data for refuse to switch to remote learning in public schools because of the concern that students would not have access to Wi-Fi. So that concern for equity puts more stress and more danger when it comes to public health. So there's this like yes. tipping balance. They have to like consider both sides and like right. and effectively make the decision. Right. Right. And also the food, right? The free lunch program yes. that helps so many kids. I know in our County, they actually would send the buses around twice a day mm -hmm. with food. Oh, wow. But it's a, it was a serious problem. And yeah, I think that the work that the team has done is fantastic. Thanks, Erin. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we're very proud of the work. It does get tedious at times, as you mentioned, but because it's we see that importance of it being used in the future, we power through it. <laughs> I know. I know. I know it was really, it's hard. <laughs> but it's so good. Mm -hmm. It's so important. You're leaving such a legacy. It's awesome. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Luca. This has been fantastic. It was great chatting with you, Erin. Thank yeah. you everyone for listening.